All right, we're going to be switching it up a little bit. Instead of Romans this morning, we're going to be in the book of Mark. We're going to be in Mark chapter number 1. Mark chapter number 1, and I think with us being in Philippians and Romans, we're getting a lot of the same things over and over. And so, uh, just praying about what the Lord would have me to teach and preach, and I, I, I believe the Lord has placed me in Mark chapter number 1. And uh, we're going to continue a study through the book of Mark. I think uh, the book of Mark is an amazing book. It's an it's a expedient book. It's a fast book. It's, it's an action-packed book. There's not a lot of fluff. Um, there's a lot of, this is what Jesus did, this is what Jesus did, this is what Jesus did. So there's not a lot of fluff. And so when we think about the book of Mark, the book of Mark was written by Mark, who also is known as John Mark. So you might see him uh, in the book of Acts, it talks about him a lot. John, whose surname is Mark, and so John Mark. And so uh, that is who wrote the book of Mark. And it's likely, based on historical evidence, is that he was a secretary for the apostle, or for Peter. And so he wrote from Peter's point of view. Peter spoke Aramaic, and, and so Mark was likely the translator who translated into the Greek so that, the, so that it could be understood by the people. And we know that Mark was no stranger to the early church. In fact, uh, the early church met in his mother's house. You can look over in Jerusalem when, when Peter was put in prison, and uh, you read that account in Acts chapter 15, Peter was in prison, they were hosting a prayer meeting at Mark's mother's house. And uh, Peter gets out of jail, you know, the, the miraculous story of how Peter just walks out of jail like nothing ever happened. And he goes and he knocks on the door and the, 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 the maid or one of the ladies at the, at the home went out and looked and saw Peter. And then she was so distraught that she went back inside and, didn't know, and he just kept standing there knocking. And so we know that Mark was no stranger to the early church, and so he was a part of it. Acts chapter number 13, verse 13, uh, this was when Paul and Barnabas were on their first missionary journey. And Mark was with them up until they got to Pamphylia, and then he quit and took a boat back home. And so the, 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 the Mark was a man of ups and downs in the ministry, just like all of us have our ups and downs in the Christian life. But not all of us are always on the mountaintops, right? There, there are some valleys in the Christian life that we must walk through. And by the grace of God, we get through and we get back to the mountaintops. And then we see in Acts chapter 15, and you look at verses 36 through 41, that Barnabas wanted to bring John Mark back on the second missionary journey. And Paul said, no way, that guy is a quitter. Uh, I don't want, uh, he's not coming with us. And so there's some contention between Barnabas and the Apostle Paul, and so Paul ended up going with Silas, and Barnabas ended up taking John Mark, and so there was a split. But then we think about the end of his life, when Paul was at the very end of his life, in 2 Timothy chapter number 4, he says, bring Mark unto me, for he is profitable for the ministry. And so we, we know that while John Mark might have made some mistakes, and he might have done some things that weren't exactly lined up with what he should have been doing. But by the grace of God, God continued to use him. And that's a that's a, a picture for all of us today. We might not always have done the right thing. We might not have grown up in the Christian home. We might not have always made all the right choices. But God is still able to use you. And God wants to use you. And so we see that Mark was used by God. This story shows that God doesn't give up on us just because we mess up. And we shouldn't give up on God just because we mess up. There are four views of Jesus in the Gospels. We know that every Gospel is written from a different point of view. So when we think about Matthew, Matthew shows Jesus as the King of the Jews, right? It was royalty. It was Jesus is King. That was the message of Matthew. Luke shows Jesus as the Son of Man. He was born of a woman. He was. It shows Him as the Son of Man. And then John shows Jesus as the Son of God. It shows the deity from the very beginning. And then we look at Mark. Mark shows Jesus as a servant. Mark shows Jesus as a servant. So when we think about a servant, that is who Jesus was. It, it didn't change. It, nothing ever changed in Jesus' life. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't come to minister, or He didn't come to be ministered unto. He came to minister unto people. And so Jesus was a servant. Now let's read verses 1 through 8. The Bible says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, 
which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his way, and make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went on, uh, there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they all of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel hair, and with a girdle of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latch of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And so we look at verse number one. Verse number one gives the message of the book. The message of the book. The book of Mark is all about the message of Christ. It's all about the message of Christ, which is the gospel. The gospel is preeminent. The gospel is first place in the book of Mark. When we look at the different gospels, the book of Matthew shows the lineage of Jesus through Joseph, which goes back to King David. Right? So Matthew is showing us the kingly line of Jesus. And then we look at the book of Luke. The, the genealogy of Luke, uh, in Luke, of Jesus goes all the way back to Adam. And it's showing Jesus as the son of man. And then the book of John begins with the deity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so it shows the deity of Christ. And we think about the book of Mark. The book of Mark doesn't have any lineage. It doesn't have any genealogy. It doesn't have any of those things. The, the book of Mark starts with the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The book of Mark has no genealogy listed. In, in, in those days, a, a servant wouldn't know their genealogy. It wasn't something that was important to them, was it? It was just, uh, while uh, the reason that they showed the genealogy in other, of other people is to show of the line that they came from, but a servant, to them it didn't matter. It didn't matter who, who, where they came from. So Jesus, this is again proving that Jesus was seen in Mark through the servanthood. The key verse of Mark is Mark chapter number 10 and verse number 45 where it says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That is, the whole goal of Jesus Christ was not to be ministered to. It was to minister. And as Christians, that should be our goal as well. We, we don't deserve anything. There's, we, we are undeserving of so much that we have. But God in His mercy showed us that we can get salvation. We don't, while we don't deserve it, we have access to it through the Son, Jesus Christ. Mark jumps right into the public ministry of Jesus. And this shows us that we need to be immediate and urgent with the gospel. We were talking about it this morning in our prayer that we have before the service and how our world is really turning upside down. It, it, our world is in a mess. It's, it's in a crazy place. The coming of Jesus Christ is imminent. It's soon. It's, it could happen at any moment. The signs of the times are appearing everywhere. But I'm thankful that, that we have a promise of Jesus Christ. And we have the good news of the gospel. And, and it'd be crazy for us to see someone's house on fire and not tell them. And that's how the world is. The world is on fire all around us. And we should be the ones telling them, hey, your house is on fire. When we think about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel is good news. It's good news. It, it shows us that it's the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scripture so we know that the gospel according to the the scripture uh, the, the authority of our life it says that it's the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ so when we believe the gospel that's what we put our faith and trust in it is the death the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and then we look at the names of Jesus that are mentioned here Jesus was his human name it was his given name. And then Christ, when we think about Jesus Christ, is more of a title. So in our day, it would be like Jesus the Christ. And so it is showing that Jesus was the Christ. And then when we look at the Son of God, it means that He was equal with God. It was God the Son. Amen? 
Jesus was fully God and fully man, and he was a servant. The whole book of Mark is about Jesus. That's my favorite thing about it. It's all about Jesus. There's no fluff. There's no... Uh, there's. The key word of Mark is straightway. I, I, I appreciate that. I like to get I like to get to the point. I don't like to, to fiddle faddle and stuff like that. I'd rather just get to the point. So the book of Mark does exactly that and it shows us the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel. Then we look at the messenger preparing for the message. There's a, there was a messenger who was going to prepare for the message of Jesus Christ. Verse number two and three are quotes directly from the Old Testament. Verse number two is a quote of Malachi 3.1 where it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. God sent John the, the Baptist to be the messenger preparing the way for the messenger of the covenant, the new covenant, right? Which is the New Testament, which is Jesus Christ. So John the Baptist was sent to prepare the people's hearts for the new covenant, which was the gospel, which really wasn't the gospel, but it was Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Verse number three is a quote from Isaiah 40, verse three. It says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. When it talks about preparing the way of the Lord in those days, when royalty would come to town, they would send someone ahead. They would send a messenger ahead that would prepare the city. It would make sure that the city was in order. It would make sure that we didn't have any bumpy roads like we have here in Stephen, right? It would make sure all the roads were flat. It would make sure that all the town was prepared. It was ready to receive a king. And so when John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way of the Lord, he was making ready the people for the message of the Lord. He wasn't the message, right? He was the preparer for the message. The message is Jesus Christ and will always be Jesus Christ. John was preparing the people for the ministry of Christ. And John was a fulfillment of both of those prophecies. Then we see John's ministry introduced. And verse number 4 says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. Because... John was the fulfillment of Malachi 3.1. In Isaiah 40 verse 3, he began to baptize in the wilderness. If he wouldn't have fulfilled those things, he would have been baptizing in vain. Right? And so he was the fulfillment of those prophecies. And then we think about this baptism of repentance from the remission of sins. Was this a different baptism? Or what, what does this thing have to do? So baptism was a common thing to the Jews. It was a ceremonial thing. It was a ceremonial practice. And so for the Jews to be able to go into the temple, they have to go through this ceremonial dip, dipping in the mikvah. And so they would walk in, they'd walk down the stairs, and on the other side they'd walk up the stairs. And it, it was a picture showing that they'd walk in as the old man and walk out as the new man and cleanse them for the temple. And so uh, if a Gentile wanted to become a proselyte or uh, a Jew by practice, not by uh, his birth, but a Jew by practice... He could participate in this baptism. It would be a picture of him leaving his old life and stepping into the new life. So John here was not preaching that, that you needed to be baptized to be saved, right? That's not what he's preaching. He's preaching that they need to have a change of thought. They need the Repentance is literally a radical change of the way that you think. And so uh, he was teaching that the Messiah was different than what they were, what they were prepared for. The Messiah was not who they had prepared for. They prepared for a king, but who was coming was a servant. He was the king of kings, but he was a servant to all. He was preparing the way for Jesus. He was telling them that they were going to have to think differently about the Messiah. They were expecting him to come as king, but John the Baptist would introduce Jesus as the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. It, it would not have been a good thing to introduce a king as a lamb. Because what is a lamb? A lamb is a dumb animal. A, a lamb is a sacrificial animal. A, a lamb was something that would be sacrificed. And so by him introducing Jesus as the lamb of God and took away the sins of the world, it, it took away all of his kingship, right? It, it, it introduced him as a sacrifice. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ was. He was a sacrifice for us. No king would be compared to a lowly lamb. A sacrificial animal. But Jesus was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And John the Baptist was preparing the people for it. And while John the Baptist prepared, think about, he had a following. 
Then he had lots of people. It says that all Ju that uh, that in verse number five, and there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem. So he had a, a pretty big following, didn't he? It, it wasn't just you know a few people here and there. No, he had, he had all the people of Jerusalem and Judea. He had the publicans. He had the sinners. He had the Sadducees. He had the Pharisees. They were all there peeking, seeing what was going on. And you know the amazing thing about John the Baptist is he didn't have the nicest facilities. He didn't. He, he was preaching in the wilderness. It shows that facilities isn't what brings people to Jesus. It's the message of Jesus that brings people to Jesus. Then we think about his clothing. It was different, wasn't it? Verse number 6 says, And John was clothed with camel's hair with a girdle of skin about his loins and to eat locusts and wild honey. His clothing was different. He was a different guy. I can imagine that that, that would bring some sort of, uh, of people around just to see, man, what in the world is this guy doing? But he was a different person. He was a different type of guy. And then we see that his diet was different. Locusts and wild honey. I don't know about you, but I don't think grasshoppers with honey sound very good. But that's what John was eating. And, and John, while his venue was different, his clothing was different, and his, his, uh, his diet was different, he was mightily used of God. This morning I'm not telling you that you should go and trade in all your, all your nice clothes for camel's hair. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm not telling you that you need to turn in you know, the, the pot roast that you have in the crock pot at home for some locusts and some wild honey. No, but what I am telling you is that as Christians we should live different. We should live different. The reason that he attracted people is because the message of Jesus Christ was different. And, and as the message is different, the messenger must be different. We can't be the same as the world. We can't look the same. We can't act the same. We can't, we can't be the same. And so this morning I'm telling you that John the Baptist was different. And as Christians, we should be different. When, the, when people look at us, they should see that there's something different about us. If we look like the world, that's what we're going to attract. The world. And guess what never happens? The message of Jesus Christ is never conveyed. Because the message of Jesus Christ was not popular with the world. It, it, it's not what people want to hear. But it's what people need to hear. Well, John the Baptist didn't have much in worldly possessions. He had the power of God on his life. Because he reflected God's truth. I don't know about you, but this morning I want God's power on my life. I, I don't want to be a powerless Christian. I, I don't want to be... Uh, there's nothing more worthless... Then when the power goes out and you go grab a flashlight and there's no batteries in it. Or the batteries are dead. Guess what? You have the tool, but you're still in darkness. That is what it's like when you're a powerless Christian. You have the tool, you have the light, but if you're not plugged into the source, the light doesn't work. Amen? And so John the Baptist was plugged into the source. And as Christians, if we want God to use us and if we want God's power in our life, we must plug ourselves in to the source. Then we see in verses 7 through 8, John's message revealed. John's message revealed. In verse number 7, it says, And he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I, after me, uh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. There cometh one mightier than I. That was a common theme of what John preached and what John taught. He, it, he says, He must increase and I must decrease. John's ministry was never about John. John the Baptist's ministry was never about John the Baptist. And our ministry should never be about us. John, John's ministry was always about Jesus, and so should ours. He must increase and I must decrease. And when it becomes more about me than about him, we have problems. Jesus should always be first place. He should always be preeminent. And we see that John's message was one of humility. John's message was one of humility. Jesus said that there was not a greater man born among women, uh, born among, among women than John the Baptist. Think about that. I don't know about you, but if Jesus, Jesus, you know, the, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, came and said, "There's not one mightier than Cody, born of woman." I, I think I take a little bit of pride in that, don't you think? I'd probably get a bumper sticker that said it, like. Proud, proud <laughs> parent of the best kid ever, you know. I, I think, it, but John, that was never what John was doing. John, uh, he immediately, when, when Jesus is saying those things about him, he's saying, he must increase and I must decrease. When people started following John more than they were following Jesus, he backed up, didn't he? He pushed them away. He said, no, 
The one you need to follow is over there. I'm not the one you need to follow. And as Christians, that should be our message as well. It's never about us. It's never about me. It, when it becomes more about the man than about the man, we're in trouble. We must push all of the glory towards Jesus. John could have been prideful. He could have got a bumper sticker made for his wagon, but he chose humility. And as Christians, we must choose humility. John says that he's not even worthy to even loose the shoes of Jesus. Think about that. The feet were the nastiest part of people. Still is the nastiest part of people. The thing about they would walk all day because they didn't really have cars, right? So they'd walk all day. So their feet were really dirty. And they'd come into the house and it was, it was a practice that they would take their shoes off and they'd get their feet washed, right? And so John says, I'm not even worthy to unloose the shoes of Jesus. That's the lowest job on the totem pole, right? That's worse than cleaning the toilets. He was the lowest on the totem pole and he says that I'm not even worthy of that job. And to be honest, none of us are worthy of that job either. Myself included. None of us. We're not worthy of the lowest job, but God has given us the power to do all things. God has given us the power. We just have to plug into the source. John the Baptist preferred Christ above all others. He exalted both the person and the work of Jesus. He said, He it is who is coming after me is preferred before me. His shoe latching. I'm not worthy to unloose. He said that in John 1.27. And he said in uh, Romans 12.10, preferring one another is, uh, in Romans 12.10, it instructs us that preferring one another is essential to a good relationship. If you want a good relationship, you place the other person above you, right? And, and how many of you know that's true? That if you want a good relationship, if you're selfish in the relationship, it's not going to be a very good relationship. It might be a good relationship for you, but it's not good for anyone else. And so we, Jesus was preferred. I, we preferred Jesus. Stephen Chapp Chappell said this, When you prefer others, you put them above yourselves. When you prefer Jesus, He becomes the focal point of your life and you begin to fulfill your life's purpose just as John the Baptist did. When you prefer others, when you put Him in His proper place, your life gets better. I'm not saying that it is perfect because we all know that the Christian life is not perfect. It's not, you are not excluded from ups and downs. But your life will fall into the will of God when you prefer Him above everything else. We should prefer Him above everything else. Then we see verse number 8. Verse number 8, it says, I indeed have baptized you with water, but He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Baptism is a picture. It's a, it's a picture. It doesn't save you. It can't save you. Uh, sprinkling doesn't save you, right? Uh, just getting baptized to say that I got baptized doesn't save you. It's a picture. What is it a picture of? It's a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So John here is saying that I baptize with you with water. He's saying that, that mine is a picture. But when Jesus comes, when, when, when His time has come, He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And I think it's very important that we don't lose that baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because while it, it was different in this day, right? The baptism of the Holy Ghost was a picture. It was a sign of salvation. And so uh, when the 3,000 were saved at Pentecost and, and the, the Holy Ghost came upon them, right? And it was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so the sign of the baptism was tongues, right? And so we believe, right, as Baptists and as true believers that tongues no longer exist. We, we no longer speak in tongues. And even if we did, the way that people speak in tongues today would not even be close to correct because tongues was a language it literally meant that they were language. So when the, when the Holy Ghost baptized them, Jesus Christ being the administer of the baptism, it wasn't the Holy Ghost that administered the baptism. No, it was Jesus who administered the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Tongues came out of it. And so these people from all over the world came together and they were speaking the same language. And they understood each other. It was amazing. But we know that tongues ceased when the, when the Word of God was completed. And so we no longer have tongues. And the Holy Spirit baptism now happens at salvation. It's when the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. He is living inside of you. So there's no longer a separate event. Well, no matter what someone tells you, no matter what the, tele the television preacher tells you, no matter what the books that you read tell you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is done, right? It happens at salvation. It's no longer a separate event. As Christians, when we are saved, the Holy Spirit indwells us. 
It's not a separate event as some would teach. Let me think about in conclusion of this first part of Mark chapter 1. In the book of Mark we learn that the gospel must be paramount. It has to be first place. It has to be preeminent. It has to be the message of the church. It must be paramount in not only our message, but in our lives. Our, our, our life should reflect the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's make sure that we are a gospel-centered church and a gospel-centered believer. If, if we lose sight the, the, of the gospel, we've lost sight of the reason for the church. The church it was commissioned to give the gospel to every nation. Right? That, that's what our church has done. And so if the church no longer is fulfilling the mission, which is the gospel, then we're no longer a church. We're a social gathering. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I want to be a church. I want to be the, I want to, I want God to use our church. I want to see God do amazing things through our church. And so if we want that to happen, we must stay on mission. And on mission is Christ-centered, gospel-centered message and lives. We also learned from the first part of Mark that the gospel has to be shared with immediacy and urgency. It's an urgent message. It's an SOS. Right? It is, it is paramount. We must tell others because the time that we have is coming to an end. The, the return of Christ is imminent. It could happen at any moment. And so the gospel must be shared with immediacy and urgency. John Phillips said this, John was a mere man. Jesus was a man much more than a man. John was a voice. Jesus was the word. John called for repentance. Jesus demanded rebirth. John was the messenger. And Jesus was was the Messiah. So I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger. Next week we're going to talk about the ministry of Jesus Christ in the start. And so next week make sure you're in your place to be in Mark chapter number 1 and verse number 9 as we kick off Jesus' ministry. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for the day that you bless us with. God, thank you for your word. God, thank you for uh, the gospel. God, thank you that, uh, that I've known it from a child. God, I'm so thankful that I didn't have to go through a lot of the things that a lot of people went through, God, but you saved me from, from a young age, and God, I've been able to live a life for you. God, help us as we continue in the book of Mark. God, just show us the gospel and, and lift uh, the gospel up. And just pray. Amen. Amen.